This is truth be told. That not only are there reptilians here. New evidence of UFO fleets. We were close to nuclear war. To help you transform so that you can live your highest truth. We're not being told just because we're not ready for it. The stations of frequency, vibrational. The, uh, I was a homicide detective with LAPD. UFOs increase. Um, visitations. Most people want to be remembered for how they lived, but today we're going to be discussing someone that is not only known for how she lived, but also how she died. Was it an accident? Was there more to it? Well, today we have award-winning author of 10 critically acclaimed nonfiction books and also a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize for history. Anthony Summers will be on the show talking about his book, Goddess, The Secret Lives of Marilyn Monroe. And you might even see the Netflix documentary, The Mystery of Marilyn Monroe. It's a great documentary. And we'll talk about the 600 people that Anthony had spoke to while writing this book, which reveals unknown truths about this brilliant but troubled woman. And her legacy lives on and I believe will live on forever. Maybe we'll come to some conclusion today about the way she lived and the way she died. I'm Tony Sweet with Truth Be Told. Please welcome to the Truth Be Told studios for the first time, the one and only best-selling author, Anthony Sum. There he is. How are you, sir? Well, it's, I don't know whether I should say hope, but it's something like the end of a season of Marilyn Monroe to me. <laughs> the, the, the Netflix documentary in, in which I took part um, about Marilyn Monroe and particularly about the end of her life um, started in, in April and enormous numbers of people have have, have apparently seen it since. And you, you are one of, of many people who've interviewed me, but I'm glad to join you because I know you don't deal with things superficially. No, no. Yeah. You know, I, I'm a big history buff myself. And a lot of the books that you write are just right up my alley, meaning uh, the heartbreak, the tragedies, and also, you know, a little mystery behind it. And, and for all of us out there watching these documentaries and reading your, you know, books like yourselves, what makes you, what, what do you think people like Marilyn Monroe stay in the spotlight are so dear to us where, you know, other actresses die of an overdose or die in a tragic accident, but they kind of get forgotten. Why do you think Marilyn still is so, you know, at the top of her game, even after this many years? Well, it's a perfectly good question to which I think there is not really a perfectly good answer. When I started, <laughs> when I got into this, I should explain to you how I began getting yes. into the story of Marilyn Please, Monroe. please. I was asked by a, a, a major British Sunday newspaper um, if I would go to Los Angeles in 1982, 1983, because the district attorney in Los Angeles had, was looking into the facts around her, her death again, her death on August the 5th, and mm -hmm. we're talking on August the 5th now, on exactly the anniversary of her death. Um, and the DA was looking into the many stories and and lies and, and, and real stories and rumors surrounding her death in, in the early um, 80s. And he asked me if I'd go to Los Angeles and do a story for him. And I'd known him for a long time. I, I got to Los Angeles from England at that time and at his expense. And I looked into, I, I knew nothing about Marilyn Monroe to speak of. <laughs> she had not been my pinup girl, if you like, <laughs> right. when, I'd been, when I was an adolescent. I think Natalie Wood was the, 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 the woman whose photograph was um, above my desk as, as a schoolboy. And I knew who she was, of course, I knew who Marilyn was. But she'd never been my pinup, and I got there and arrived in Los Angeles, completely green, and realized that this was a big, big story. And within 10 days, I was calling the editor who'd sent me from London 
and saying, I can't do this as a story for you. I would just do a shallow, not especially interesting, superficial story. Right. I think I, I'm going to do a book. And the editor, who fortunately had known me for a long time, um, said, well, <laughs> you don't owe me for your airfare and your accommodation in Los Angeles so far, as long as I can have the serial rights if you write a book. And um, so, so um, that that's what happened. I, I dumped the article and started writing a book. And it took me, I think, a, a two years plus of um, living on the ground in, in Los Angeles. I say on the ground. I, in fact, found a little house. Um, in Topanga Canyon, oh yeah, which I'd known in the known in the past when I was working for the BBC because the Manson family, mm -hmm. the who, had, who committed the the terrible murders, had lived up Topanga Canyon, um, and so I found myself living up there with my then wife and child, working on finding out from the start with no preconceived ideas about Marilyn Monroe, which was the best way to start. It was good that she hadn't been my my pinup girl, as I put it, because I, I she was just a, a, a photograph to me, right. a, a photograph right. that I'd seen in newspapers. And very early on, I got in touch with the woman who had been her kind of companion housekeeper in the last months of her life. And that that drew me into detail and things that she remembered, but not only about the end of her life, also of the early days. I found a man who had once been a boy um, in the in the early, in the mid fifties, um, who had been a fan of hers in New York as a young fifteen-year-old, and had become his name's Jim Haspiel. And he'd become the world's expert on photographs of Marilyn Monroe. <laughs> and um, I just sucked up information. In the end, did 650-some interviews. Wow. That's the one tape. And, and worked on the story on, altogether on her life for, for three or four years. And my book, Goddess, is, is the result. So when, when I saw over 600 uh, interviews, I knew it didn't take you just a few days or a few weeks or even a few years. It definitely, that's a lot of interviews to uh, convince people to open up about Marilyn. And uh, what was your approach? Because a lot of people over the years have wanted to exploit her and, you know, show different sides but also sometimes not in a good light so how did you approach these interviews to say i'm i'm trying to you know write a book and just be biased about it but you know also keep her legacy going well i suppose i projected as an ignorant limey uh, <laughs> probably um, which was more, more or less true but i had for years before then been working for the BBC, the British Broadcasting right. Corporation. And quick aside, before that, for the Swiss Broadcasting Corporation, that may, may, may mean absolutely nothing to you, but there is a story that comes with it. Um, I had been working for the overseas service of the Swiss Broadcasting Corporation um, on, in radio. Right. And we would, we, we would say that tonight we, we were broadcasting to Africa from Switzerland. And we, we would say to each other in the newsroom, probably we've got both our African listeners listening <laughs> in tonight. Um, but it was a very good apprenticeship because the Swiss run no story. If they only have it on one source or one or two sources, they need it from a multitude of sources if, for it to be printable, hmm. for it to be transmittable. And then I came to the BBC, which I, I believe still has internationally a good good record right. for responsible reporting. And I had, I had spent years doing a lot of foreign coverage in uh, countries. It was the time of the Vietnam War. I was in Vietnam a lot and in, in the Middle East. And um, 
on war, war stories, you have an even more of a duty to to make things that, that can't be to do things that, as far as possible, can't be contradicted, can't be refuted. Right. Uh, I don't want to. I don't want to sound holier than now and, and over responsible, <laughs> but right. coming into the complete nightmare of facts and factoids and down straight out lying about Hollywood stars and particularly Marilyn Monroe, I had to draw myself back and and think, how am I going to deal with this and not just write candy floss um, right. fuzz? And that led me in the end into doing the number of interviews that you mentioned. Uh, 650 was the number of people that 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 I talked to on audio tape. I talked to more like a thousand um, people that I, I didn't actually put up on put, tape, put on yeah. audio. And it was an interesting moment because in the early to mid 80s, she was dead just over a decade, just over uh, over 10 years. And um, people who had refused to talk about her, often simply because they loved her. Um, mm. or were close to her and respected her and didn't want to talk to her in the crazy months and years right after she died. By 10 or so la years later, they themselves were getting on a bit, a lot of them, right. and thinking, well, if they were ever going to tell their story about Marilyn Monroe, they, they should now do it. And, of course, now those same people that I interviewed are most of them long dead. Yeah. So yeah. I came into the story. Perfect timing. Probably at the perfect moment. Yeah. Was there a moment uh, of, uh, you know, of those 651 interviews that it really clicked how important this book could be? Uh, yes, because remember that the original reason I, I was assigned the story for, for a short piece uh, was about her death and the DA was examining the rumors, some right. of them real nut, nutcase rumors about how she may, maybe died and I, I had to, to treat that responsibly and by the time I got into the learning about the woman, the human being mm -hmm. um, the human being in the sense that our friends or wives or families are human beings to us, I had become, I, I became increasingly sympathetic to her. I, I think beyond the headlines, the ghoulish ones about her death mm -hmm. and, um, and the interesting ones about scandals she'd been associated with and so on, one has to look beyond. And one, one thing that I found early was that beyond all the razzmatazz, this was a, a very intelligent woman with no significant education, <laughs> but a woman who, once she became an adult, was greedy for information, <laughs> who sucked up, up knowledge and literature and science as well, like, like a vacuum cleaner, um, she was as likely to be seen with a Dostoevsky or some great Russian novel when she was on the sets of her early and mostly awful early movies. Right. Um, and, and she would, oh, here's the thing. Um, this was a woman who learned, she was interested in bodies and particularly in her body um, because in... She wanted to um, to be fit and do the exercises that made her fit. Marilyn Monroe was was running through the alleyways and small streets of Hollywood mm -hmm. a decade before the fad of, of jogging and the internet. She was running every morning at six, seven o'clock in the morning. Um, and I, she was just greedy for knowledge. When she was on a, on a set, People saw from an early age um, that, that she'd be writing in a, usually a little black notebook, um, which one had them now, but they've all disappeared. Um, she, it wasn't exactly a diary, but just a, an, an, a notebook in which she 
scribbled thoughts that came to her, conversations she had right. for years and years. Um, she was a really interesting woman um, and fascinated by what went on and awed by what went on around her, um, which went far beyond the cardboard cutout image of the cliche about the Marilyn, the, the pinup girl. And so I was drawn in and became more and more interested in the, the interest has lasted to this day. Yeah, and I can see that in your writing and also even in the documentary how passionate you became about this uh, because to put that type of work in something, you can't go in just 50%. You definitely put everything into it. Uh, I'd like to draw, jump back to when she was a child, her childhood, because I know it was very traumatic, you know, foster care, uh, molestation, I, I'm I'm assuming this is where a lot of her tragedy, uh, tragedy and uh, unhappiness started, um, and she took that into her adulthood. Could you talk about her for the people that may only know her as the actress on screen about her childhood and what what really motivated her to become who she is today? Or well, you're you're quite right, of course, that it was a deprived childhood. Yeah. Um, she did not know, although later, thanks to her own investigation, she had a pretty darn good guess at who her father was. Um, her, her father did not marry her mother. Her mother had been divorced. Um, her mother would, when, when Monroe was a little girl, point to, to a picture on the wall of, of a man with a moustache who looked like somebody who was very famous at the time, Clark Gable. Hmm. Um, and and uh, it was another of those coincidences and ironies in, in, in Marilyn's life. But of course, later, she would work with Clark, Clark Gable on, on a movie um, in the, 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 on, on, the, on the Misfits and on the Asheville Jungle, I think the Asheville Jungle. Um, she 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 worked with with Clark Gable, but he was not the man in the photograph. The man in the photograph was almost certainly um, a, a guy called Gifford, who had been a film cutter, as in those days they were called, a film editor, hmm. um, at the the studio where her mother was also had been a film cutter, but the mother um, had all sorts of serious. Um, psychiatric problems, more crudely mental illness, and wound up in a mental asylum, hmm. which when Marilyn began to succeed herself and, and made made money in movies, she funded her mother being kept in, in the mental asylum. The mother, ironically, outlived Marilyn Monroe and was hmm. to be seen um, into the 80s, cycling, wearing, a, I think, a red raincoat, which is pretty silly in Florida in the summer, <laughs> um, cycling around, a, 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 on a bicycle, cycling around a town in, <laughs> in, in, in Florida. But yes, Marilyn had a, a, a childhood deprived of proper parenting. And when she talked to a man called Ben Hecht, um, who was her first biographer um, when she was just becoming famous. She talked about her, her rape, or, or her not her rape, that's the wrong word, how a man had interfered with her sexually um, when, when, when she was just a, 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 still an early teenage, mm. teenage girl. How much co and and how she'd been chased by a man and how a man had broken into the house and how she'd worked at some point as a whore. A great cluster of allegations about herself. Very difficult to know how much of it to believe and how much of it she was spinning stories about. I don't want to suggest that Marilyn Monroe was a consummate liar throughout her life. But I, Ben Hecht, who did those early interviews, mm -hmm. didn't doubt that she'd embroidered things to make them more impactful. 
and uh, I, it's impossible to say because she's gone and no, there's no one there to confirm anything that happened in her childhood. But I tend to agree with him. She, she didn't all. She wasn't interested, and in adhering to the factual truth. Mm. Yeah, I when I was watching the documentary and reading the book, um, I I could see even throughout her life and through her relationships personally, not necessarily professionally. Um, it was almost like if you want to even look at Joe DiMaggio and Arthur Allen or Arthur Miller, they they almost look more like a father figure because it wasn't like they were overly attractive, you know, and, but she, they, she seemed to be really in love with them, but they also started, you know, being abusive. And I think even Joe DiMaggio called her a whore, I think maybe I, well, I yeah. so and, and it's like a pattern. And it's fairly response. Sorry to interrupt. You. No, you're yeah, fairly responsibly reported that very soon after she was back from honeymoon with DiMaggio, she was talking to, I think it was to Sidney Skolsky, I may be wrong, but a reporter um, who, a decent man and I talked to, long dead now, um, a re Hollywood reporter who almost paternally um, talked to her over many, many years, including just, just before she died. And Sidney Skolsky said that quite soon after she'd married DiMaggio, she was talking about how one of these days she was going to marry a playwright called Arthur Miller. Hmm. And Skolsky shook himself and said, but you just got married. <laughs> and she was talking about it lightly at the time, but she had met Arthur Miller on a film set um, and just had conversations with him, and she admired him a lot. You mentioned... Um, that one of them physically abused her, and that is Joe DiMaggio. Yeah. Joe DiMaggio, hero, national hero, baseball, um, and um, had been on honeymoon, and he said, with, with Marilyn, and asked about it afterwards, how was the honeymoon? He said, well, it's no fun being married to an electric light. <laughs> um, they, had been, they had been to um, Korea to see the troops in, in Korea together. Right. And I, I am sure that at that point, Marilyn was was not abusing the marriage. She, she was fa fa faithful to Joe DiMaggio, but she was being exploited in the movies. Um, and uh, there came that that extraordinary movie um, in, in which the famous picture, you know, of her skirt blowing up. Um, and showing, her, just beginning to show her underwear, that's the one. And and um, Joe DiMaggio was an Italian, obviously, family man, very macho, mm -hmm. and he objected enormously to see his wife in that kind of a spectacle. And that night at the hotel, um, members of the crew who were in, the adjoining bedrooms or suites in, in New York um, heard shouts and screams from, from next door. And um, one of the women who, who helped her in, on the set for hairdos and makeup right. and so on. I remember hearing this. Remembered, thing. remembered tending to her bruises and he knocked her about. I mean, he didn't hit her on the face, but he hit her on, on the shoulders and, and back. And I believe that happened. I, I don't think that in general, DiMaggio was physically abusive, and certainly Arthur Miller, the playwright, was not uh, abusive physically, so far as I've ever heard. I think possibly if there's such a thing as intellectual abuse, that he sometimes went off into high culture areas that were a bit beyond mm. her. But I think, how can one talk about love in the dead um, right. our own love affairs and marriages are difficult enough to describe um, and people have over described and have been over invasive of certainly of Marilyn Monroe's life but I think he's that Arthur Miller 
sometimes kept her out of the flights of intellectual thinking that 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 he he was engaged in uh, and she felt a bit demeaned in that way but i think she was genuinely in love with the, both those people that it's she seemed like fairly it. responsibly that when she had been divorced from miller for a while just before she died mm -hmm. that she was considering remarrying joe dimaggio oh really yeah i didn't know that so after I'm gonna I'm gonna go back a little bit before, but I I, I want to ask this question on her marriages. How did it affect her mental state once they divorced? Because, like I said, we usually in a relationship, you you never know what goes on. You just hear what hearsay, what people hear from Marilyn, or maybe hear from Joe DiMaggio or Arthur Miller, but. We talked about Marilyn lying sometimes, or you know, I, I think because sometimes maybe orphans, and she didn't like to be called an orphan. She liked to be called a wait. Was it a waif? I think is what she called. Yes. How how did she sometimes maybe create some of these scenarios in her head? Because I know I you know I grew up, my siblings were way older, and you know I didn't necessarily lie, but I definitely were more creative in my mind because I didn't have my siblings there to play with because they were quite a bit older than me, and so I was kind of the only child. How did she kind of create things in her mind um, that may have she might start believing? Did you hear anything like that? Uh, I don't quite understand you, and I need to understand you. You mean that? How did? What did she create in her? What illusions did she create? Yeah, what illusions that she may have created in her mind, whether it be you know how sometimes people, women and men, they get in relationships, and in their mind, it's way better than what the relationship is, or even it's way worse than what the relationship is. Yes. I, I think that is, that is so, certainly, of the marriage to Joe DiMaggio. She wanted in her mind to be, after this deprived childhood, right. deprived of love, with a mother who didn't have a man but who talked about family, and Marilyn growing up in, in an America that to, in, in which, at least on paper, family was so important. And... She fantasized a life. There we go. In which she would cook and cook cook for Joe DiMaggio and have babies with Joe DiMaggio. Mm -hmm. Joe DiMaggio indulged that because Italian baseball hero absolutely wanted to have a lot of children. multiple <laughs> children with her. The multiple children never came, and that itself is is a major facet of Marilyn Monroe's life. Um, she said that she told, said to a woman friend um, that she had had 13 abortions. Abortions? Now, oh, my God. Abor abortions wow. and, miscar and miscarriages. Um, now, abortion at that point was forbidden in the United right. States. It, the first um, abortion, publicized abortion by a woman who flew to Scandinavia to have it, was just after Marilyn died in 1962. And everything's now, as you know, coming full circle because of the change of law by, by the Supreme Court. Right. Then um, said that she had had um, 13 abortions, hmm. all, all of which would have been illegal or, or what we would, would have called once backstreet abortions. Right, right. A, f a friend of hers described her battlefield of a womb um I, I mean it is a sad story e even to think about it um she had suffered apparently this can be brought, brought on uh, the um, abortions and badly done abortions can bring on uh, endometriosis mm -hmm. she certainly suffered from endometriosis which meant that she was unlikely to be able successfully to have children mm. and she this disturbed her hugely. She really wanted or thought she really wanted to have children. And when she was married to, to um, Arthur Miller, the playwright, she had 
um, at, at least two miscarriages that I, I think have been res responsibly reported. Um, so that w was a, an abiding sadness for her. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and, and, and you can't think of her life as a woman um, without constantly being aware of her unhappiness in that respect. Right. Yeah. And I, I remember hearing in the documentary, she said she, if she had to choose between fame and children or, if, you know, she would choose children, which, you know, I'm sure as, as a woman, especially back then, it made her probably feel that she wasn't living up to her full ability because she, she definitely liked to be. And her, her concept of what happiness was, maternal yes. happiness. Yes. Having had having been deprived of that kind of, of, of the family life she mm -hmm. imagined for herself when she was herself a child. Yes. I want to go back to, thing. I want to go back to the early fifties because when she started rising in fame, you know, and I hate to say this in some ways, Hollywood back in the day, <clears throat> she was a beautiful woman, but there were a lot of beautiful women in Hollywood trying to become an actress, trying to become famous or, and what, what do you think personally that made her stand out more than other people trying to do the same thing, getting the same parts. What was it about her and that, you know, through the interviews that you've talked to and even personally think that that spark in her that made her who she was and when did, and did, was she always Marilyn Monroe as when she started acting or did that persona well, kind of grow as she grew? No, I, I mean, of course, at the beginning, she had walk-on parts. She had little right. parts. Right, I think it was Groucho Marx who who just saw her walk across a, a film set, um, a movie set. And, of course, she had been practicing the Monroe walk. <laughs> um, uh, and we've seen it in, in the movies. And, of course, it was a sexy walk, but it was... It was really calculated. She had um, a costume designer who worked with her who taught her how to do that kind of sexy walk and the trick, <laughs> just in case you ever know anybody who, who needs to do it. I don't recommend it to you. Um, <laughs> is, <laughs> um, is to cut a little bit off one of your high, if you have two high heels shoes on, to cut a little bit, carefully calculated off just one of the high heel shoes. And that makes the hips move in a different way. <laughs> um, so there's, there's one of Marilyn Monroe's secrets for you. Um, <laughs> and, and of course, we started in this conversation talking about her as an, in the early days as a, a wow pinup girl. She, w she was all of that. But John, the director, John Houston, who directed her in two films and at two different stages of her life, he was dying and I went to talk to him. He was dying, I think, of lung cancer. Um, I went to see him. We, we made friends because he had no other. He was in bed and mm. not so ill, but clearly going to not live very long. And he talked very, very openly. Um, I liked him a lot. And he said that quite separately from all the razzmatazz about her Marilyn, the sexy Marilyn, that she had an aura about her, something that he described better than I'm going to be able to now, that there was something about her that when she walked into a room or walked into, on, onto a set, she the, just the, 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 called it a vibe today, that the, the, the vibe she put out was just really special you can mm -hmm. see it if you see diamonds are a girl best friend or one of those films she just was so she 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 you just couldn't forget her when she came to a room um okay. and or or got onto a film set so it was the combination of of the two things and a combination of her intellectual interest in her in acting and her movies 
she worked and worked um, to to make every scene she did better than than the last. Hmm. In that sense, she had a sort of inferiority complex. Yeah, um, you could say she was never satisfied with anything that she did, and people everywhere, whether they were would-be lovers or whether they were directors on movie sets, were just struck by this is someone who scintillates, who is different in a special way. Well, I want to get into this. Um, when she first started out, I I didn't realize that, that John F. Kennedy had been seeing her since the early 50s, which I thought it was more when he became president, but that wasn't true. He was already seeing her for several years. Is that correct? Well, you, you just used the word true. Um, <laughs> tr truth is an elusive thing in general. Right. <laughs> um, truth is an, even more elusive when we're talking about Hollywood, and truth is super elusive when we're talking about the Kennedys and Marilyn Monroe. Um, but I did talk to people who I think one or two people who I thought were responsible and not just loose lipped about Marilyn um, in, in, her, in, um, in the early 50s when Kennedy himself, <coughs> Kennedy that was going to become President Kennedy, mm -hmm. was not that one well known when he was a young senator. Right. And he was going out to the West Coast where his father, of course, Joe Kennedy, had long been involved in, in making Hollywood movies. Um, and let us not pretend, one does not need to pretend about JFK. Um, he was, and it, it's fully established, and I've heard it from people who knew him, women who knew him and slept with him, and... and um, all sorts of sources, secrets, former sort, secret service men and so on, with JFK, even after he was married, was promiscuous. <laughs> and uh, it was more a matter of wham, bam, thank you, ma'am, than, than, than uh, serious <laughs> affairs. Right. But um, Marilyn... Um, and, and therefore, one has to really pick and choose between, alleg between allegations about what the involvement was between Marilyn and President Kennedy. I do believe there was an involvement, and I believe it especially because of a series of interviews I did with a man called W.J. Weatherby, who was a reporter for The Guardian. I don't know if you know The Guardian. but I've heard The Guardian, a, yes. A, a very sober-sided um famously picky about what it prints mm -hmm. um newspaper in, in the uk which was especially that way in those days and marilyn had been interviewed in that would be 1960, 1960 two years before her death um by a man called wj weatherby of the guardian on the set of the misfits he was based in new york and she looked him up and used to go and so I say a, a bar somewhere near a dingy little bar um, <laughs> off Eighth Avenue and sit with W. J. Weatherby um, and say and, and talk about her life. And hmm. she began talking about the, somebody she was seeing. Then it it became mm -hmm. clearer that the somebody she was seeing um, was one of the candidates and so on. And Weatherby kept his notes and showed them to me. Uh, and he was a, a very serious, sober-sided journalist. Um, and I do believe that probably she knew him fleetingly in the 50s, as you asked, in California. Probably a matter of wham, bam, thank you, ma'am. There were a couple of, of t test testimonies from agents, secretaries, and people who remembered them both being at the same social event. Right. And then in the months leading up to the presidency, she began to see him and was, she was fascinated and impressed with herself for being with around the, him. Yeah. And this 
I, I do not have many facts uh, about the extent to which this continued when he was president, except that it was clear that it continued. And it continued putting Ken President Kennedy in great jeopardy of scandal. You, you know that he was married to Jackie Kennedy. Mm -hmm. The image for the country was of the handsome young president happily married to a beautiful young wife. Uh, but in fact, he was continuing his affairs with secretaries and uh, all ranging all the way to Marilyn Monroe. <laughs> in the meantime, the Secret Service knew about it. Too many people knew about it. And it became clear to the Kennedys' um, real enemies in the mob and organized crime, which was being pursued as never before by Kennedy's brother, Attorney General Robert Kennedy. Right. Um, that and they, the mob wanted to have dirt on President Kennedy. Too long to talk about in detail now, but I am satisfied from the number of different interviews that I was in the end able to do with different um, people involved in illegal eavesdropping, electronic eavesdropping on telephones and so on. Um, that Monroe was was um, was overheard on mobs really mobsters um, wiretapping um, at Ke the Kennedy brother-in-law's house in Malibu, Peter Lawford. Yeah, Peter Lawford. Um, yeah. And that that the the compromising information started there and went on into the stage when. She became involved, and we have to be much more careful here because Bobby Kennedy was a completely different pers personality mm -hmm. from his brother. When she in turn became involved with the president's brother, the attorney general. What began it? Well, um, I found letters, original hand -letten, handwritten letters that Mount Monroe wrote at the beginning of 62 when... Um, she met Robert Kennedy socially. I talked to one of his his aides who recalled Monroe getting drunk mm. and Bobby driving her home and the, the the Kennedy aide going along to make sure that everything was proper and not compromising to Bobby Kennedy. Why did he get involved with her? Um, well, I think initially, maybe, and this is guessing on my part, because his brother wanted him to get her to distance herself. He's, he, his brother saw the danger. But I mm. think there was an affair. Um, I talked to the daughter of Marilyn's then West Coast psychiatrist, and who was in her late teens, and she remembered Marilyn saying to her, First of all, that she was having an affair with somebody, with a very important man. Um, and it, uh, and then she said that the man is called the general. <laughs> well, of course, Bobby Kennedy wasn't an, a, a general in the army, right. um, but was the attorney general and was known as the general by people who worked on the staff at the Justice Department. I talked to Bobby Kennedy's... Um, Secret, long time secretary at the Justice Department, Angie Novello. And she recalled that Marilyn would ring very often and he would always take her call. So mm. whatever it began as, I think it became some sort of sexual affair with, with Bobby Kennedy as well. Um, I, I think this in part because what the wiretappers told me, the eavesdroppers told me, and I also tend to believe it because of a conversation I had with um, Arthur Schlesinger, the great Kennedy historian who himself worked in the Kennedy administration hmm. and wrote a wonderful biography of Robert Kennedy, uh, which is absolutely not about gossip and sexual stuff. Um, but I asked him flat out whether there'd been an affair between Bobby and, and, and Marilyn, what those contacts were about. And he 
had lunch. Well, we we had lunch in New York, and and he he was very careful in what he said. But he said, "Look, he was nothing like his brother. This was a man who was married with, I think, at the time, nine children. Yeah, he had a lot of kids." <laughs> But he said, Robert Kennedy was a man. He traveled a lot, um, and and he knew a lot of people, including in show business. And he said he was human. He was frail human, like the rest of us. Mm -hmm. um, and and this very responsible historian, who knew the Kennedys well encouraged me to think that there had had been had been some kind of an affair and i suppose i can believe it um however married you are if you're on the road and if you're in an apartment with marilyn monroe and she w opens the bedroom door i think there's a high likelihood that you will follow her through it <laughs> right right yeah and uh because of time's getting almost to the end here i can't believe it but I know they also shared very important details about the atomic uh, programs, and you know the mob was trying to find dirt on the Kennedys and you know Fidel Castro, all these different things. The, you know, many people have led it to believe that you know was this an overdose? Was this a suicide? Was this murder? From all the interviews you've ever done and information do you feel like this was just a tragic accident or do you feel like well, there was other things involved well you you just said a, a whole mouthful there <laughs> um, right i i think one quickly to pick up on is the allegation that she uh, which i found in an fbi document um that marilyn had been discussing quote from an fbi document the morality of atomic testing with one of the kennedys 1962, the year of the missile crisis, the nearest the world has ever come to, to nuclear war. Yes. Marilyn went to Mexico City that year to buy furniture and spent her time with the Hollywood 10, the, the, the exiled communist hmm. scriptwriters and so on. And, and the FBI was watching. And for years, those documents had been, when I first read the book, had been censored. So they were just black tape. Right. But now one can see that there was an allegation in a file called, it sounds funny, but Marilyn Monroe C, Marilyn Monroe Communist. Um, security matter. This would worry the likes of J. Edgar Hoover. Well, your second question, and we don't have time to talk about it properly, but I think it's important to say how I concluded after all the intrigue and and rumor uh, about how she died there is no evidence repeat no evidence in, uh, that she was murdered as has been suggested by many people there was no blunt trauma she hadn't been knocked mm -hmm. around um that the autopsy showed that there were no injection marks um so far as the forensic man could see she had not been injected with a drug but the evidence from internal organs was that she died from a um, barbiturate poisoning from sleeping pill. Mm -hmm. There was an empty bottle of sleeping pills beside the bed in which she died. Um, and um, I think the most likely thing, and we can only say the most likely all these years later, is that she died either by suicide because she was very, very upset about the Kennedys breaking off relations with her, or she died because she simply took an accidental overdose. She had done this before on both, right. both efforts to kill herself and accidental overdoses years ago, years before she actually died. That is the most one can say about the manner of her death. And I think it happened after a day in which she had had a bruising, I should not use that word, a very upsetting confrontation with Robert Kennedy. Well, there you have it uh, from a man that 
spent many years and many interviews that, uh, you know, truth be told, we like to do a little conspiracy once in a while. But uh, I think that uh, you, if anybody knows majority of the truth, I believe you would would have gotten it out of 651 interviews. Plus, well, more than that, because like you said, about over a thousand. Yeah. Um, but uh, I... I thank you for being here, and, and especially the day after the 60th anniversary, uh, you know, August 4th is when she died, and today's August 5th, so 60 years ago, she passed away, and uh, I really appreciate you taking the time all the way from Ireland. Uh, that's my DNA genetics. That's the highest of my DNA is Irish. <laughs> but I really appreciate you uh, being on the show and sharing your knowledge and your years of work. And keep keep it up because it sounds like you have another book that you're working on. Yes, we, yes, we have. Thank you very much. It's been my pleasure. And uh, thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Uh, please, uh, you can go to uh, Anthony Summers' website at anthonysummers.com. Uh, pick up a book there. Check out all his books. There's tons of them. And uh, please go to Amazon. You could pick it up there also. And uh, leave a comment and review. We, uh, it always helps with everything. And, and watch the series on Netflix. And uh, until next time, I'm Tony Sweet with Truth Be Told. Please subscribe, share, and uh support our almost 700 episodes that we've done over the many many years about eight years so until next time i'm tony sweet take care of yourself this has been another episode of truth be told thank you so much for watching recorded live at ubn go studios in burbank california join us on social media facebook truth be told radio instagram truth be told paranormal Go to Truth Be Told Worldwide for more information on upcoming shows.